Let's talk on this and a few of the other big stories of the day. Henry Hill is Deputy Editor at Conservative Home. Henry, good afternoon to you, sir. Good afternoon. Um, you'll be familiar with all of these <coughs> arguments. We've discussed them when you've been on with us before. Um, is doomsday around the corner? Are we going to die? Is what is happening in Spain as a result of people a couple of years back driving big cars? Uh, what are you making of this argument? I think it's really unfortunate that, you know, climate change is a is is a problem in the macro sense uh, it does cause challenges you know we we see this when summers get hotter people whose buildings aren't built for it they risk getting overheating there are adaptations that we need to make but you're right in that the the doomsday clock which is always just being put back it's always we've got five years and then five years go past and oh my god we've got five years to to do whatever it is that these campaigners want us to do it really doesn't help the credibility of the cause like, and time and time again, we've seen the, the science on this change, famously in the 1970s, where we were supposed to be worried about global cooling. Uh, more recently, do you remember a few years ago, all the worries about desertification? Yeah. Uh, you talked a second ago about uh, the planet looking like Mars. Well, it turns out that an environment with more carbon in the atmosphere is good for plants. So actually, yeah. uh, a lot of the world's deserts are shrinking, and there's going to be more green space. Now, obviously, those plants will then scoop up more carbon. So... There are, I think, serious advantages to shifting towards green energy, especially nuclear energy. It means it doesn't pump out pollution, which is bad for people anyway, you know, breathing in sure. coal smoke and all the rest of it. But yeah, this idea that if we don't do anything, then a variation of a couple of degrees is going to make the human race extinct is, is palpably ridiculous. And as you say, it's more ridiculous because if politicians genuinely believed this they would be governing in a very different way to the way that they are. And it's funny which politicians believe it. Let's have a listen then to Theresa May. Scientists, of course, as a result of what is happening in Spain, um, say that climate change has made floods going on in Spain at the moment worse. Uh, we know that 95 people have died. Former Tory MP uh, spoke in the House of Lords last week on climate change. I was surprised. I didn't even know. Firstly, I'd forgotten Theresa May was even in the House of Lords. Um, this I th that was her maiden speech. I'm not absolutely sure. But she certainly is. And I've never really heard her animated on this particular issue. Let's have a listen. So in looking at climate change, in dealing with climate change, I believe there is an economic benefit it can bring jobs and prosperity, but it can also help us reduce vulnerability to modern slavery and human trafficking. And so I would urge the government and all across this House to recognise the need to deal with climate change, to save our planet and to save our humanity. So there it is, Henry. Uh, that's the former Conservative Prime Minister, to save our planet and humanity. I mean, it doesn't get any more kind of stark than that when it comes to warnings. Uh, no, I, I sort of wish I knew what her connection was between uh, climate change and modern slavery. Uh, modern slavery was a cause which Theresa May took up in office, and it was a perfectly yeah. good one. But I don't know, you know, so I don't think all of these causes necessarily connect together mm. in the way that some campaigners like to say that they do and again look at look at the way i've always got a bit of a bugbear about this because theresa may obviously did net zero and i'm someone who supports the principle of net zero actually because clean energy is guilt-free energy once we've got energy that doesn't pollute we can have as much of it as we want build 10 nuclear power stations build 20 make electricity too cheap to bother metering all of that good stuff but the way that she did it is that she said right we're going to have this legally binding target and then i'm going to set that for just far enough in the future that I'm not going to have to worry about it. Yes. And I'm going to leave it to lots, to, to, to subsequent generations and subsequent politicians yeah. to do all of the actual work. And we saw the same thing with Rishi Sunak smoking ban. It's a real bad habit for our politicians. Yeah. They try and get credit for the good intentions and they leave the implementation to other yeah, people. Yeah, absolutely. And on the climate issue, I mean, it, it would all, it would be fine if we were just talking about, you know, well, they have this view, some people have that view, you have your view, Henry, all of that is fine. Uh, if it didn't affect everybody else, but of course, if you look at the budget yesterday, the, the multi-billions of pounds that are being invested in the name of this cause, and I'm not just talking about net zero here, I'm talking about money being sent all over the show uh, because of the climate emergency as it's uh, now constantly described. Uh, so it does have an effect on all of us, and I think it's reasonable that we would ask the question bearing in mind it's costing us a lot of money to apparently deal with something that most of us either don't understand or don't believe. 
It, it is. And on the budget specifically, again, there, you know, there's £22 billion over 10 years allocated for Ed Miliband's pet project of carbon capture and storage. Now, you know, I've got nothing against carbon capture and storage, but this is the same budget in which the Chancellor goes slowed on nuclear power. Yeah. Right. Nothing about small modular reactors, which is a technology where Britain could not only build them in Britain, but could also then export them to other countries that are you know, polluting and build up Britain's balance of trade. Nothing on that. Yeah. So the budget is ridiculous. And I think it's really telling. And it's, a, it's an indictment of our political class, really, that, that, that climate change is a thing that invites big solutions. Right. China has just announced that it's going to build the world's first nuclear powered cargo ship. You know, the massive container ships. Yeah. Now, if you can clean up cargo shipping, one of the most polluting industries in the world, that will be the equivalent of taking something like 10, 20 or more Britons out of the atmosphere every year in terms of pollution. And we have Rolls Royce with its small modular reactors. We have a shipbuilding industry that's on its knees. We could have been doing that. Yes. Yeah. And instead, we've let China do that while we're getting on with capping the maximum size of windows on people's houses, yeah. whacking a few more taxes on things. And it's, trying it's to ridiculous. squeeze a heat pump into the 18th floor of a block of flats in Hackney. I mean, mm. you know, where, where does it stop? So there's a sense of madness here as well. Let's go to the budget then, Henry. Yesterday, of course, Rachel Reeves delivered the Halloween budget. Uh, the number crunchers have been in. £300 a year worse off for most Brits, yet she has still claimed it won't affect the working person. Let's have a listen to her comments on that specific issue of tax rises. I will not increase your national insurance. I will not increase your VAT and I will not increase your income tax. Working people will not see higher taxes in their payslips as a result of the choices that I am making today is a promise made and a promise fulfilled. Yeah. Well, is it a promise fulfilled, Henry, if we, you know, when we look behind the scenes of, of some of these calculations, it appears that quite a lot of Brits will be worse off. I mean, any any Brit who freelances through a company, for starters, because they pay employ, employers national insurance, but if you look at the crucial thing is, if you look at the INFS, what they've said about this, is that the way that the government has done the increase in employers' national insurance means that it falls disproportionately on lower wage workers. And some three quarters of the increase is projected to be fed through to lower paid workers in the form of lower wages. So if you've got the government up in court, your honour, is this technically a tax rise on working people? Only the ones who own a business. But is it making life better for working people? No, they're going to be paid less. And the OBR says it's going to crowd out private investment. Basically, the government has uh, ha has suppressed private sector wages whilst giving big bungs uh, to public sector workers in exchange for no productivity, which is only going to make the, the books worse. And you know what that means? Because if we have even higher public sector bills in the future and an anemic economy, that means the government's going to have to come back and whack even more taxes on, on workers mm. functionally, because most taxes are taxes on workers in one way or another in order to balance the books in two or three years' time. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, this was just the first budget. She's got, like, three or four still to come uh, over the next few years. So we will wait and see yeah. what's going to be in those ones.